This is Beyond the Big Screen Podcast with your host, Steve Guerra. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Big Screen Podcast, where we talk about great movies and stories so great they should be movies. Find show notes, links to subscribe, and leave Apple Podcast reviews by going to our website, beyondthebigscreen.com. And now, let's go beyond the big screen. Hello, friends. Steve here with a quick announcement about today's episode. This episode is a part of a series that Mustache Chris and I did on the film Iceman. In this episode, we will get into some of the background and the history and the context behind the Iceman and other related characters in this fascinating story. The Iceman, of course, was the serial killer slash mob hitman who developed and created an identity that may or may not have been rooted in fact. We really hope you enjoy these episodes and then which will culminate in the discussion on the film. Before we get on with the show, one thing that you can do that will really help us out is if you can hit the like and subscribe button to this episode if you are listening on YouTube. Or if you're not listening on YouTube, go and like and subscribe to the podcast there. We really hope you enjoy these episodes. We'd love to hear your feedback down in the comments. Let us know what you think and let's get into it. I'm excited again to be joined by Chris to talk about the background of a really infamous and in a sick way, intriguing mafia figure, Roy DeMeo. Chris and I are jumping into a really the deep end of the mafia pool here, and we're really glad you uh, joined us today. This episode and the previous episode on Richard Kuklinski, the Iceman, is going to build a lot of background that we'll use to talk about the 2012 movie Iceman. So let's really get into it. and. I think Roy DeMeo is maybe not a he's probably not one of the names that really comes up as one of people's first like most known mafia figures, especially uh, compared to his contemporary of somebody like John Gotti. But he was really extremely influential in his time and maybe one of the most intriguing mafia characters of all time. What do you think just like your first brush and your first blush, I guess you might say, of Roy DeMeo? Yeah, it's like pointed out that Roy DeMeo isn't um, as particularly particularly well known as some of these other mafia guys. I think one of the reasons is where Hollywood and popular culture tries to present the mafia as kind of glitz and glamorous to a degree where it, it almost seems like kind of like a fun thing where like when you start reading about Roy DeMeo, it's the exact opposite of that. It's the kind of really really what the mob is you know boiled down to its essence and roy kind of perfectly represents that where it's it's not glitz and glamour uh, glamour it's it's rough it's dirty it's kind of vile and disgusting it's a horror story really i mean if you if you took away and said that this wasn't real and you just told somebody about a I mean, not to give away too much, but a place where people go in, they get murdered and dismembered and just disappear. It, it's literally a scene from a horror movie, Ray De, De Mayo's life. Yeah. You know, and it's it really does come across. Yeah. His entire life is it's like a kind of like what you would think would be like almost like a cheesy B kind of horror film where you know this guy is he's one thing what uh to a certain group of people but then like when he's not away when he's away from those people he's is he's an upstanding citizen it's it really but you know this is real it's a it's a hundred percent real i am um, doing a little bit of ancestry.com i knew from my family that there was demeos that's sort of the or- overarching uh family that my family belongs to is my 
great grandmother was her maiden name was DeMeo. And I tried so desperately to see if I was some connection to Roy. I didn't find it, but it's not that uncommon. Uh, it's not that common of a name. I, I'm going to keep finding out. Maybe we'll do an update at some point and see if there's in some weird way I'm distantly related to Roy DeMeo. But, um, the, really, the, the best way to start out trying to dig into Roy DeMeo and try and learn something about him is his kind of messed up childhood. Tell us tell us about Roy DeMeo's really screwed up childhood. Yeah, it wasn't as bad. It wasn't like don't get it wasn't anything like Richard's, but it's it's yeah, it's a pretty weird childhood. Like Roy was uh I mean, he would struggle with weight issues his entire life, but growing up he was picked on for being overweight by uh from the other kids. His brother was kind of looked upon as the the golden child. He was going to become the doctor and the the family kind of devoted their attention to him. And Roy really looked up to him too and Pretty early on, he went to go serve in Vietnam. I believe he volunteered. He wasn't drafted or anything. And he was uh, he was killed in Vietnam. And Roy had a really hard time dealing with this because he didn't really have his older brother there to uh, protect him from the bullies. So he learned to protect himself. This is he started weightlifting and took up boxing and uh, became, you know, pretty known as pretty ruthless street fighter but then you know shortly after his brother uh passes away he uh his father dies unexpectedly too and this is a really weird thing is his mother came up with this idea that she was gonna go back to italy you know to be around friends and family and kind of left roy by himself and his you know what was he in his early 20s at the time not even right yeah that whole thing with roy's childhood he the DeMeos and they they kind of spell this out and it's it's hard to psychoanalyze somebody who's been dead for 40 years and uh, you know things that happened 60 years ago but he um he's his family was successful his one uncle was a uh a uh, high ranking prosecutor in Brooklyn another was the head medical examiner of New York City or some part of New York City government. Uh, so doctors, lawyers, Roy's father was working class and they lived in a pretty rough and tumble, rough and uh, rough part of Brooklyn. But a lot of successful people came out of there. So you can't necessarily just say that Roy came from a rough family like Richard Kuklinski, like you had mentioned. But you also can't say that it so it wasn't all just his background there's something in roy i think that he he was mean and all these things like his brother getting killed in vietnam and uh, the the mafia thing that was kind of floating around this rough part of brooklyn that he lived in it all kind of got boiled down in him and just brought out the very worst in Roy, I think. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, he he had to learn to take care of himself at a pretty young age. And, you know, in comparison to Richard, yeah, this seems like a cakewalk. But <laughs> I mean, that's pretty tragic. His brother dying in Vietnam and then his father passing away pretty, uh, when he was still young and then his mom leaving for Italy. And I mean, that, that to me, I'd really I just can't understand the logic in her head but i mean maybe she talked to roy and roy told her you know, just go but it seems like a really weird choice to make and yeah you know and he i believe he ends up becoming like a butcher's apprentice and a delivery driver and he does really good at that and he actually becomes like the best like delivery meat delivery guy and he ends up earning extra money and learning quickly that he can use this extra money to do some you know low tier loan sharking did you maybe when i was when i read that roy de mayo's mom brought i think it was his younger brother to italy to go yeah. live did you think that maybe there was just some kernel that she was trying to get the younger brother away from roy it's it's very possible i mean their mothers know their sons probably better than anybody right and maybe she saw the direction that Roy was going in and didn't want 
her youngest son to fall in those uh, fall in that uh, type of crowd. It, it's very possible. That's another one. But, you know, the what ifs. But what if Roy's brother had come back from Vietnam as a hero and Roy I think that that could have been something where Roy goes and joins the Marines, too, and goes to Vietnam. And then we don't have Roy DeMeo. Like, I honestly think that it could have been that Roy became so embittered with everything that at that just really critical time in his development, he sees his brother do something that... A lot of people, like I think the father wasn't so much into the brother joining the Marines, but it really it really did like open up all this anger that Roy had clamped down inside of him. It just gave him a, an escape valve to just say, you know what, screw everything. Steve here with a quick word from our sponsors. Yeah, for sure, especially at a young age, the, that type of uh tragedy uh you know losing losing a young brother can trigger those types of emotions and some people i mean it's fairly common for that to come out of people most people are able to like rein it back in over time which they they go through like the grieving process where obviously with roy that just never happened then I think one other element to the whole story is that the mafia was really never that far away from where they were, where they were living. I mean, they were living in an area that there was mobsters all over the place. And was it Roy's mom who wound up going to live with Joe Profacci's, the one of the biggest mafia guys of all times, widowed wife? Yeah. And it wasn't like this might get me in a little bit of trouble, but like many Italians, Italian Americans at that time uh, that we're talking about kind of they viewed the mob where those are our bad guys. You know what I mean? Where they it was just something that people grew around with and they grew up around with and they just kind of accepted it. It's like every group has their you know quote unquote bad guys and the mob just happens to be our bad guys and you know it's kind of um it's a i use a comparison it's kind of like the hell's angels a little bit up here in canada where especially in like the quebec uh area where it's just something that's just it's not as bad as it used to be but it used to be like really like all over the place and it was just everybody kind of knew somebody who was kind of part of the hell's angels you know even if they were just on you know the very edges of it or they they knew somebody that knew somebody and i mean this is kind of how the mob was and especially in like areas like brooklyn at the time where i mean everyone just kind of especially if you were italian you probably knew somebody who was you know some you know somewhat related to the mob to one degree or another and it was um you know, you also didn't really trust the federal government and state authorities at the time, too. So you didn't really talk to them about it either. And everybody knew kind of what happened to people that talked too. I know. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think especially somebody like Roy, who had this legitimate part of his family who were at the highest levels of government. But like you said, nobody in Brooklyn in the 1950s or the 1960s was that far away from some connection to the mafia, even as yeah. straight as people wanted to be that it was still you were in school. I think um, I can't remember who was the mobsters that were that lived just down the street from Roy DeMeo and he would hang out with them. It might have been the Profaci kids. And I think both of those yeah. Profaci kids wound up becoming doctors or lawyers or something legit. But it was it was never that far away from being from some connection to the mafia. Now, Roy clearly doesn't go into the legitimate direction. He fully embraces the mafia. What's kind of his early career in crime? Well, it's like I pointed out, he, he was a apprentice butcher and he was very good at that. And he was a, like a delivery boy and he, you know, we do more deliveries than everybody else. And, you know, he, with the extra cash that he earned from doing this, he would loan money out to, you know, early loan sharking at exorbitant interest. And then quickly he got into auto car theft, basically, you know, stealing car parts, stealing cars, um, chop shops. And he was doing this under the, the Casey family, which is one of the five families. But 
who were actually more known for this is the kind of weird part about this story. Like the Glucasey family were kind of known more for like these blue collar kind of crimes or the like auto theft and what have you. But uh, somebody in the Gambino family um, named Nino Gaggi sees Roy DeMeo and sees, you know, this guy's really good at what he does. He's really effective and he's a good earner and says, well, come join, you know, come with me, come join the Gambino family. You'll make even more money. And this is kind of how his criminal career starts. Yeah, he and Roy starts off. And like you said, there was the five families and we've talked about the five families a little bit. But at this point, not all families are equal. And the Lucchese are kind of a low end mafia doing these things that are kind of low end crimes. And then Nino Gaggi comes in and I think that Nino really saw the potential in Roy DeMeo, that Roy DeMeo could make a lot of money. Yeah. And he makes a lot of he makes a ton of money uh, doing this. And this is also the time period where he starts setting up the early part of like the DeMeo crew. And this is where he meets uh, Chris Rosenberg, who is a pretty fascinating character. He's this Jewish guy that grew up in an Italian neighborhood and hated the fact that he was Jewish, you know, you know, basically thought of himself as Italian. I mean, he was Italian in anything, but, you know, I guess genetics or race or however you want to view it. And he had this dream that he was going to be the first Jewish guy that was going to be made in the Italian family. And I mean, I mean, it's pretty ambitious. I mean, they didn't even make they didn't even make uh, Meyer Lansky. So I mean, <laughs> he's like he's he's a funny guy, not but not really because he's we'll get into it later. He's completely ruthless. But Roy takes him under his wing and kind of use him as his kind of little brother or kind of like a son sort of. And, you know, Roy would loan out. Uh, Chris was also into big into drug dealing and so. Roy would loan him out money so he can buy more amounts of drugs and Roy would make money and Chris would make money and Joseph and Patrick Testa and Anthony Center. And there were a couple other guys, but those are the three. Those are like the the main guys in the DeMeo crew. And yeah, he goes from there. And I mean, somehow during this time period, too, somehow Roy wounds up being like uh, part of the board of directors of a credit union that he uses to uh, launder money and um, from his car theft uh, operations, but also like the drug dealing uh, operations that he has going on with uh, Chris Rosenberg. I don't think it's too far to say that Roy was really a criminal genius. He really understood how to make money with all these different things that he did. I mean, it's really it's crazy all the different ways that he was earning money. One thing, though, is that at this point in the the mafia in the 70s, early 70s, the, the they say opening up the books is that they weren't making a lot of new mafia members at the time. So there was a lot of people like Roy DeMeo who were not strictly and by by definition in the mafia they were attached to people like nino gaji who was a made man but they weren't yeah. a lot of new people weren't being made at that time so you had people like uh roy de mayo making fabulous amounts of money but they weren't directly a part of the mafia which gave them a lot of latitude to do things like drugs and working with with Jews and Irish and all these different other gangs in a way that if they were fully made members of the mafia, they wouldn't be allowed to do. Yeah. And it would, in the uh, book murder machine, they get into this where like Nino even is trying to, well, when we get to it, we'll get to, when we get to that part, but like Nino is trying to would tell Roy sometimes, you know, you're probably better off not being made because if the, you know, the guys at the top of the family found out some of the stuff that you were up to, it would, you know, cause a lot of problems for yourself, but you know, that we'll get into that, um, um, a little bit later into the podcast. Well, why don't we talk about a little bit right now about Nino Gaggi, because he is a really interesting character in this whole thing. Yeah. So yeah, Nino, he's a made guy in the uh, Gambino crime family and he, he grew up around the mob, right? And this has basically been his, uh, his entire life and he ends up becoming a, a capo which is the boss of the 
like a crew kind of how it works in the mafia after Gambino dies and Paul Castellano takes over and he's like a weird guy because he's 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 old school but he's not really old school and I don't know how would you describe him he's I think that really is he's the old school in a lot of ways but he's also um I think he's very American in a lot of ways too. Yeah. I mean, and there's this great story. I don't know if you want to consider it great or not, but like he got into uh, an argument with, I believe it was a boxer. I'm trying to remember this guy's name right now. They got into a fist fight. was his last name. Yeah. Gennaro. And he like broke his nose or roughed him up a little bit. And, you know, Gaji just swore revenge and it took about, 12 years and got his revenge after repeated tr- repeated attempts of trying to get his revenge on this guy this is just the type of person like nino was as an example like the story it shouldn't be funny but it is kind of funny it seems like something that you would you know that would come out of a comedy kind of I th- nino just seemed to a guy like he wanted to think he was vito corleone from the godfather yeah. i mean he even talked about a lot about that but he was really a small time hood in a lot of in most every way he made a lot of money but he wasn't very well thought out with it or anything like that and he wasn't hitting hitting guys all the time or and he screwed up a lot of things he just he's the a low to me a low rent mobster and i'm i'm glad he's not alive to hear me say that but he's just not very impressive <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I would. Yeah, I would agree with that. But I mean, he definitely knew he's very like as much he might not probably wouldn't like this, but he's very much a a street guy. Right. Um, And doing like low end crimes and, you know, stuff that's not particularly glamorous. But I mean, if you do read this book, Murder Machine, I suggest you look into it, too, is the it might not sound sexy, you know, doing chop cars and selling used car parts and stealing cars, but you would not believe the amount of money that's involved in these types of operations. And, uh, I mean, I think Nino would probably is probably the best boss that Roy would have because Nino's the type of guy, he's just going to turn a blind eye to most of the stuff that Roy was up to, um, minus maybe one thing that we'll get into in a little bit, but, even then, Nino just kind of, you know, yelled at Roy a bit and then just kind of let Roy do his own thing again. I think Nino, all Nino was concerned with was money. Whatever was yeah. happening, he just wanted the money. And he wa- he was a really bottom line kind of guy. He didn't want a lot of stuff getting in the way of the bottom line. Yeah. Loan sharking is a really interesting part of the mafia because it really is the nitty gritty. And like you said, it's the not very sexy part of the mafia, but that's where they made a ton of money was loaning money out at these exorbitant rates where people would have to pay huge interest balloon payments. We might call them now called VIGs once a week of you know, the huge percentages of the of the uh, base amount that the, the people would take out and they would really have to take out another loan shark loan to be able to just pay the interest on these loans. And it was kind of a once you got into that system of taking out a loan shark loan, you were never going to get out of it. Yeah, and people like Roy, you, you would use it too, or okay, like okay, whatever. You're never gonna pay, be able to pay your loan again. Okay, so I, I'm part of your business now, fifty percent. Or in the case of the Gemini Lounge, the guy who had actually owned the bar at the time had a loan out uh, for Roy, and he was never gonna be able to pay it off. So Roy said he saw an opportunity. It's like, oh, this is where I can do my business. It's got an apartment in the back, and you know it's uh it's a nice place i like it okay whatever give me your bar just send your bar off to me and that's it we'll call it even and that the, a lot of the times this is how these mob guys would build up these little business bars these people would take loans out percent of the business or 50 percent, or just the entire thing steve here again with a quick word from our sponsors Let's talk about Andre Katz. That was one of the first big murders that Roy DeMeo was involved with. And 
it was one of the first ones that really got a lot of police attention put on him. Yeah, so Andre Katz was, he was involved in the uh, chop shop business with Roy, and it's not exactly sure what happened, or he ends up getting busted, with, and Chris Rosenberg was there too, and some people say it was like related to the drugs that Chris Rosenberg was selling at the time, and but... Andre Katz just kind of comes to the conclusion. He's like, well, I'm not going to jail for these guys and, you know, volunteers to go talk to the uh, authorities about, you know, the chop shop and the drug, the drug business that was going on in his uh, in his uh, facilities. Roy finds out that he was doing this because Roy had paid uh, police officers off in the stolen vehicles department of the NYPD. I'm not exactly sure what the department's called, but this is what they they specialize in stolen vehicles and said that, you know, the cats is talking and Roy comes up with this plan. Well, we can, he, he knows too much, so we got to get rid of him. So they they hire this this young lady to lure cats into i believe it was like a hotel or something and roy and his crew kidnap him and then they end up um killing him at the this meet at this uh supermarket and dispose of the body and this is where the gemini method kind of slowly starts where you know they chop the body up and they start you know depositing parts in various dumps around the city but they don't do it quite well this time because apparently some pedestrian saw like a leg um sticking out of a trash can <laughs> or something and then um they end up learning that they have to become you know more efficient cleaner at this and this is um we're going to be getting into some things that are definitely not family friendly so to speak and we're not going to be graphic with it at all but this is very brutal stuff and i would definitely suggest that maybe for the next uh couple of minutes you screen this for content if you're listening in the minivan but the gemini method the gemini was the name of the club that roy had taken over uh, through his loan sharking and so the this crew of really psychotic killers that Roy gathers together in the very broad strokes. And we don't really need to get into all the nitty gritty. People can read uh, Murder Machine and there's plenty of other information out there on uh, on the specifics on how they killed people at the Gemini. But in general, what were they doing at the Gemini? Yeah, so they used the gem. It was called the Gemini method because it took place in the Gemini Lounge, and they would lure people into the back apartment, which was at the. You can look up pictures. You can see the Gemini Lounge. You can see this where the apartment building was. They would lure people back there, and basically, without getting into like a ton of the details, because it's it's rough stuff. Um, they came up with pretty much the most efficient way and cleanest way of getting rid of somebody who was trouble and disposing of the body. So that was, there was really no way to, if there was no body, there was no crime at the end of the day. They, they, the cops could be like, well, we look, we saw him go into the Gemini, Gemini lounge. And Roy could be, well, you know, he left, you know, a couple hours later and then the cops are just left. If they can't find a body, they have no, they have nothing to pursue. And this was highly effective. You know, there's different reports about, you know, did Roy and his crew kill up to 200 people, 100 people? I didn't think it was probably around 100. I think it was 47 or 49. They can officially confirm were done by the DeMeo crew. But, you know, to kind of put this in perspective, nobody really had taken industrial murder. Um, nobody had done this since pretty much, you know, Murder Incorporated. Yeah, they would um, they would really dispose of the bodies. They had a garbage dump and nobody's going those, those garbage dumps like in New York City. They're getting feet of garbage piled every single day in there and so i mean if you don't know about something if you want to look for something that happened a week ago you could be digging through hundreds of feet of garbage it's just never going to happen you know no police department in the world has the tools uh 
to do that. Yeah. And they were at one point they did think about like start digging through this garbage later on when they were trying to find some of these uh, bodies so they could pin more, you know, crimes on Roy. And they, I, they looked at it and they said like, this is just not possible. There's no way to do it. I mean, and if when, you know, you look into how they came up with the Gemini method and then the disposal of the body is, it's coolish, but I mean, it's, it's, brilliant it, it worked for the amount of murders that these guys were doing you know and roy was personally personally did a lot of these murders himself i mean so if we're looking at like a hundred people let's just say let's just say let's just say it's a hundred people i mean how many did the green river killer kill nowhere near that i don't think i mean you could say that like roy was one of the worst if not the worst like serial killers in American history, depending on how you look at it. I wouldn't say Roy was a serial killer just because there's a little, I don't really want to, you know, compare and contrast, but I mean, in terms of just the body count, yeah, it's like a hundred people. That's in Ted Bundy wasn't anywhere near that. It's also, I think that this is a good place to really mark that Roy, the Roy, the businessman is a mafia guy. He saw he, within this time period, if I'm not mistaken, he does get his button or he gets becomes a made member of the mafia kind of against not everybody wanted him to become a made man. No. Uh, well, so Bino dies and Paul Castellano becomes the head of the family. And so the books open up. And Roy is button, you know, get me, you know, get me my button, get me my button. I've earned it. I've earned it. I mean, and for the family, he, you know, he was taking murder contracts and he was doing all the dirty work that nobody else really, well, it's not that nobody else really wanted to do. It's just nobody else was doing it as good as Roy was. And Paul kind of looked down at these street guys. He didn't really like being associated with them. And I mean, that's not a, I mean, that's not fair from, you know, from Paul to be saying that because he would take their money anyways. Uh, but the one thing that Paul was like, Roy, he's uncontrollable. He's, this guy is a loose cannon and I can't really I can't really trust him. So Paul didn't really want to make him a made man. And so Roy comes to the conclusion, well, I just got to make even more money and then they can't possibly deny me. And he opens up an alliance with the Westies, who are a pretty infamous gang of the, I believe it's the Hell's Kitchen area of New York. They're like the Irish mob. And by opening up this alliance with the Westies, he's able to, um, he opens up like construction contracts, which is what Paul was really into. He was more into like the labor union type stuff, the more white collar crimes. And the Westies end up becoming kind of like a an arm of the Gambino family because of uh, Roy DeMeo and uh, Nino Gaggi setting up a meeting between, I can't remember the head of the Westies at the time, him and Paul Castellano. And later on, Roy ends up becoming the, the, the go-between between the Gambino family and the Westies in terms of just all business deals. And this is like a pretty huge deal because the Westies are infamous game because of their brutality but they also controlled like a they had a lot of power in new york at the time and this is basically because roy's able to pull this off paul really can't deny making him a a made guy anymore and he gets his made status and we're going to wrap up today's episode right here but if you enjoy what you're hearing Come and check us out on part two of this episode. While you're waiting, it would be great if you could leave a rating and review on iTunes. Go like us on our Facebook page and group and all of our other social media. You can find all of that and more at beyondthebigscreen.com. We'll talk to you next time. 